Hello again, I'm Reverend Joshua Flynn and welcome to your daily devotional. I trust that you are keeping well and I hope that you are able to see God's hand in the midst of whatever hardship you're going through at the moment, whether it's COVID related or something else. God is ever present and I know he's with you and I hope that you see that too. We're in the middle at the moment of uh, Matthew 24. Uh, this is the uh, fifth in a series of talking through some of the passages in the Bible about end times. We began by looking at 2 Thessalonians 2, and now we are looking at the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. It's one of three passages in the Gospels that refer to uh, these events. Uh, again, uh, I'm not going to read through the whole chapter. There's a lot in this chapter. Um, instead, I'm just going to kind of point at particular verses, uh, and I'd encourage you, if you haven't seen the last two, or if you uh, haven't read the passage or aren't familiar with the passage, uh, then read it now. Uh, otherwise, go back and look at the other two, uh, two studies on this chapter. <clears throat> Last couple of times, we've looked here at how Christ was speaking about a particular localized judgment, which we can see in hindsight now, uh, and that it came, um, it came upon Jerusalem in AD 70. But it's also true, as we read through this chapter, that not everything there can be taken to refer to that event. He says in verse 36, for example, that nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. And that seems, at least on the surface, a point past just the imminent coming of the destruction of the temple. But he also, because uh, that's not quite sufficient to draw that conclusion, he also says in verse 6 that the end is not yet, and the yet is talking about the events that will happen in AD 70. And in verse 14, that the gospel will need to be proclaimed throughout the whole world, and only then will the end come. And so it's clear, especially from that, that Christ can't be talking only about AD 70 and the fall of Jerusalem again and the destruction of the temple then, uh, because we're still here 2,000 years later. And Jesus can't have been wrong about that. The gospel is still going forth, so the end can't have yet come. So like we've talked about in the past two devotions, there are really two prophecies layered over each other in this chapter. Jesus says in verse 8 that the events of AD 70 are something like birth pangs, and that implies that the end would be uh, some kind of delivery. It seems to imply that AD 70, destruction of Jerusalem, stands as both a type of Christ's final return and judgment, which we talked about yesterday, but also a beginning of sorts to an age characterized by certain things. And so in that sense, the tribulation, what we call the tribulation, began about the time of Christ's death and will be complete when he finally returns. And this seems to be why John in Revelation 1 verse 9 introduces his the, the letter that he writes to the churches, uh, so the uh, Christendom at the time, uh, and he says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. Uh, he, he seems to have interpreted that the general suffering and persecution which the church was facing as the tribulation or thlipsis in Greek. Uh, but in the midst of that, in the midst of all the suffering and tribulation, uh, that you know, he's awaiting the return of Christ, even within that, he found peace and endurance in Christ. Um, he could do so with patience as he waited for the end of that time. So why do I talk about this for a devotional, apart from the fact that it comes up uh, as we just naturally go through passages about end times and try and find out what the Bible has to say about it? Well, you've no doubt come across people very recently who have said, perhaps to you or to someone else or on social media, that our times must be, uh, right now, must be the end of the age. And perhaps they'll point to particular events and they'll say things like, um, see, there are wars, like Christ talks about in this passage. It must be the end of the age because there are lots of wars. And, and look at all the other bad things like this lockdown, the virus and the shooting last year and other things that are happening in times, I suspect. Well, well, in, in one sense, <laughs> people who say such things are right. And yet, if they're only looking at the events in their lifetime as a testimony to it being in end times, their view is far too narrow. You see, any student of history could tell you that there have been thousands of wars and hundreds of thousands of rumors of wars over the past 2,000 years 
there have been tsunamis, there have been earthquakes, there have been a huge amounts of issues um, uh, that, that, that have occurred, plagues and the like. But, but, but such a person may say, well, well, hang on a second, we seem to be getting worse. It's never happened with the same frequency. But to that, I, I kind of ask, well, well, have they been getting worse? I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not necessarily saying that we're getting better, but there have been a lot of terrible events over the millenniums, and not just recently, and all of them together serve to remind us about how messed up and painful life this side of heaven can be. I mean, look, to, to, put, it, to put it bluntly, I agree with such people. I, I believe we are in end times. But what we suffer now isn't inherently worse than what our forefathers suffered during the Crusades or the Black Plague or the slavery or the Great Depression of the 1930s or the World Wars and so on, so on, so on. Christ has not yet come. And so we still live in what is termed, seeming to me, in Scripture as the end times. We are in the tribulation. We are under suffering, whether that's persecution or whether that's uh, wars or rumors of wars or whether that's earthquakes and, and viruses or whatnot. We are suffering. Uh, and just like in Romans 8, the earth groans as they await the coming and the return of Christ. Even the earth is crying out. Uh, in labor pains. That's Paul's expression, just like it's Christ's expression here. And so we're told by Christ, and uh, just like Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, we're told to keep our eyes fixed on the goal and to be attentive and awake. And I'm going to explore that a little bit more tomorrow. But in relation to that today, one of the thematic considerations to end times that we see in Scripture, and we saw it in 2 Thessalonians 2, I didn't make a big deal of it, I want to talk about it a bit more today, is that Jesus warns that there will be those who will even call themselves the Christ and will do great signs and wonders. They'll call themselves the Anointed One. And in fact, even in relation to that, their testimony and their exhibitions of power will seem to be legitimate. But Jesus says that if you follow them, they will lead you astray. Now, there have been lots and lots of occasions over the past 2,000 years uh, where there have been people who have come, and even, even without saying that uh, they are the Christ, there have been plenty of false teachers who have turned around and said, well, uh, we are a true prophet from the Lord, and we say this and that and the other thing, and yet it contradicts Scripture. And so it's so obvious that they uh, lead people astray from the gospel. Um, we've even got cults these days, um, echoes of cults in the past, and heresies uh, which were dealt with by the church uh, thousands of years ago. Um, and, and that you know they come out and they say, Jesus has come in South Korea, or Jesus has come, you know, and... And where is he now? Oh, he died like 12 years ago, but his wife is still present. And so you, you wrestle with that when you get people knocking at your door talking about these things, and you're kind of scratching your head going, that, that doesn't seem biblical, even though they're quoting from the Bible. And yet the fact is, as we know from Scripture very clearly, even the devil knows the Word of God, and will use it to seek to lead people astray. And so this is one of the characteristics, Christ says, of the end of the age. Now, to that end, I don't know what church you go to, if you go to church at all. But if you are a Christian, you're probably familiar with that phrase, love unites, but doctrine divides. And there's a steady move in modern churches to try to avoid any difference of opinion on matters of truth, on matters of doctrine. And simply instead, to open wide the arms to anyone and everyone who self-identifies as a Christian, as if, uh, it, the, the, the nature of the truth, what you actually believe about Jesus is completely irrelevant just because you profess his name. We're all one massive happy family. And in one way, I think that's wonderful. You know, it's not appropriate for a Christian to be divisive or proud, and it's actually an amazing thing to be able to say, yes, let's try and find ways in which we are united and together. That's good. But in another way, the statement is a dangerous one. 
And the reason why it's so dangerous is it serves to undermine the very warnings that Christ and Peter and Paul and others after him are raising in the New Testament. If there are false teachers that Christ is warning us about in these end times, but they call themselves Christians, how do you know they're false? I mean, there is such a thing as the church of Satan. That seems like an easy one. That's an easy distinction. It's like, okay, the Bible says Satan's wrong, so you know, I guess they're them, and we as Christians are us. But, but what about people who actually identify themselves as Christians and are saying, this is what the Bible says? On what basis do you determine whether they're leading you to Jesus or leading you to hell, which is the implication, again, of what Jesus is teaching? And the clear answer to this, necessarily so, is that you need to search the scriptures. You need to check what such people are saying against the very words of God. So if you have questions and you go to your leaders to talk, and, and yet their answers are based on private words of revelation that they themselves have received that directly contradict the Bible, then you've got a pretty good indication that they're probably leading you astray. And if, if their ministries aren't defined primarily with what the Bible teaches, that the Bible is the, the words of life, well, again, it's probably a pretty good indication that they're not of Christ. Or at the very least, they shouldn't be leading, but they should be learning. But you say, you say, but, but hang on, hang on, they did miracles. They've had dreams. They've prophesied over people and it came true. They're, great healers or whatever. Well, isn't that exactly what Christ and Paul has said would be signs of those trying to lead you astray from the truth? Signs of end times that you've got to be very wary of? I mean, why, why do I make this point here and now? Well, because Christ warns his people that there will be wolves that look like sheep. And if you're not wary of this, particularly in times when you seem to feel this intensity of end times, or well, all the more you should be careful. If you're not wary of this, then you too might be devoured. And the only way you're going to know the difference is by the word of God, what we call it inscripturated. Look to the Bible. Look to the word of God written in the pages of scripture. This is very, very, very important, and I can't stress this enough. Read your Bible daily. If you can't find the answers there, ask someone who is wise, who is a good, um, uh, who is a good scholar of Scripture um, and studies it uh, thoroughly, and uh, look for good quality commentaries on, on passages that, that you are not sure of. Uh, but do not eliminate your study of the Bible in these end times, uh, and while you're concerned simply because someone else tells you, oh, you need to listen to me because I've done great signs and wonders. Okay, now, The word of God is what's really important, and it's in the word that we find this incredible comfort of who Christ is, what God has done for his people, how we are to live our lives in response to this. There's a, there's a real challenge here, and we need to be careful. Now, we can't take this lightly. But tomorrow I'll just pick up the last part of this chapter and the fig tree, and uh, which is where the Olivet Discourse gets its name, and what on the surface appears to be the rapture, but isn't necessarily what you think it is at the end of this chapter. Uh, but, but I'll leave it here for today. Um, please uh, continue to pray for uh, the gospel to go forth, that God will bring more people to a saving knowledge of him. Pray that he might give you opportunities to witness to your neighbors. Pray for your neighbors regularly. I, I'm sure that you do already. Uh, and trust that God will provide you with the opportunities to, to minister to them. Also, please remember uh, to pray, and again, I'm sure you're doing this already as well, that God will bring an end to the spread of this virus, particularly so that we as a church might be able to worship him together, uh, assembled together the way that he calls us to, that we might be able to celebrate the Lord's Supper uh, together, which we haven't been able to do uh, thus far because we're apart. Um, so keep praying. God hears your prayers, and he does he, he, he delights to answer our prayers. So prayer is a very, very valuable thing for us to be doing. Call in the name of Christ out to our Father in heaven for all your needs and trust in him. Till next time.